Option Green, Climate Change and Community is presented by the East Brunswick Public Library and the Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission. Funding is provided by the American Library Association's Resilient Communities, Libraries Respond to Climate Change, and the East Brunswick Friends of the Library. Thank you to all of the public libraries who are our community partners. For more information about Option Green, visit ebpl.org forward slash option green. Good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Hosick, and I am the adult programming librarian at the East Brunswick Public Library. Um, thank you so much for coming to our Option Green series that's hosted by the library and the Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission. My name is Melissa Hosick, as I said, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. Before we get started, I want to thank the American Library Association's Resilient Communities, Libraries Respond to Climate Change, initiative, which is funding tonight's event. Thank you to ALA. Hold on one second. I need to lower a volume. Yeah. Thank you to ALA and all of our community partners for helping to bring these important discussions about climate change and sustainability to our neighbors. Please note that this event is being live captioned. And let me put that link actually in there for you. I'll put that in the chat box as soon as I'm done speaking. If you have any questions during the presentation, Please preface with the word question to make it easier for us to see them. Please also be respectful to the others chatting with you, whether you are on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. I'm excited to introduce tonight's speaker for our discussion of the documentary, Decoding the Weather Machine, which will have a New Jersey spin. I'm guessing you figured that out by our presenter tonight. Dr. David A. Robinson is a distinguished professor of geography at Rutgers University and New Jersey State climatologist. He is a frequent speaker on issues pertaining to New Jersey's weather and climate. Makes sense. He is a contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Dave is a fellow American Meteorological Society member and a recipient of American Association of Geographers Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks very much. Uh, and we found out that Melissa and I are both alums of Dickinson College, so we found something in common, although I predated her by quite a few years. Uh, but anyway, good evening, everyone. And it's really a pleasure re to be back at the East Brunswick Public Library. I spoke there several years ago. Uh, wish I could be there in person, but this also provides the opportunity for more, perhaps to hear us, uh, the folks in East Brunswick and the community partners around Middlesex County. So it, it's, it's just a great opportunity for everyone to get together. And hopefully uh, you've enjoyed, you've seen uh, the video, um, Decoding the Weather Machine. Uh, it's just two years old, so it's still a very topical uh, video, very topical program. And, and as Melissa said, I'm going to put a little bit of a Jersey spin on things when it comes to what was shown in that presentation. So moving on here. Whoops. Melissa, I can't advance my slides. Hold on one second and we'll switch over to my screen. <laughs> and see guys, this is why we have backups. And there we go. Okay, um, well, just let me know when you need me to do yep. advance. All right, so I can't advance them, huh? Okay, all right, so next slide, please. Um, uh, greetings from the State Climate Office. In case you didn't know, we had one in New Jersey. I hope many of you do know this. Um, it's at Rutgers University. It's part of the Agricultural Experiment Station. I am an appointed uh, in an appointed position. Uh, I was appointed 31 years ago, so it's totally uh, obviously apolitical. I serve at the uh, favor of the dean of the Agricultural Experiment Station, and who is also 
part uh, leads the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers. Uh, and this is via a decree from Governor Byrne back in the late 1970s. So there is a tie into the state on this, but um, it, it, it's a position that's been held at Rutgers ever since Governor Byrne uh, declared it as such. Um, we're here to help people. We're here to answer people's questions, help you make decisions. It could be decision made by the governor in a severe storm situation or the Department of Environmental Protection or Transportation or Health, or it could be someone in the private sector seeking some information, or it could be just you, as you'll see in a little while, just knowing what to put on, where to put on a coat <laughs> tomorrow morning uh, if you happen to be going out or, um, and, and also just help make climate decisions, weather decisions yourself. So not going to stretch that too long. Um, I think it's very obvious to everyone, especially all of you who took the time to come in this evening, that weather and climate impact all aspects of New Jersey. Weather, the very short term today, tomorrow, the next week. Climate, looking back in the past and looking weeks and months and decades into the future, uh, they, they intertwine at about the one to two week, three week level. You can't be a good meteorologist without being knowing your climatology and, and vice versa. Um, so anyway, th it's these weather and climate impacts are across the board. A huge part of our gross national product is impacted by the weather, our health, our safety, um, the availability to have drinking water, um, our travel, so on and so forth. And here you can see examples from throughout New Jersey, um, be it an ice storm in the top right there with power outages, agriculture in the top left, the impacts of Sandy in the two bottom left, the left middle and bottom left figure, fires in the Pinelands, transportation, what exit are we from in Jersey and recreation. Next slide shows you a few more of those ex examples, um, but from a pure meteorologic, climatologic standpoint, the breach of the Barrier Peninsula at Manahawk and uh, Manaloking, excuse me, during Sandy in the top right, big snowstorm weighting down trees in the top right, the ice storm again, a drought, uh, that's a cornfield in August, they shouldn't look like that, um, but on occasion we get that. A uh, flash flood taking, pulling cars off a, a car lot and pulling them into a stream in Little Ferry two summers ago. Um, the rare but not totally uncommon tornado in New Jersey. We had nine in 2019 and four in 2020. Um, and hail, the size of golf balls. Literally, that's outside of my office on Livingston campus in Piscataway about 15 years ago. But we had several hail storms of that size this past summer across the, in parts of the state. And that map of New Jersey um, just shows you five board, you know, ballpark climate regions within the state where there's an impact from elevation, proximity to the ocean, um, latitude, the Pinelands there in the green, uh, the industrial um, corridor, the he more heavily trafficked corridor where you have urban effects on a micro to meso scale. Um, so while a small state, we do have quite a variety in our climate uh, from north to south, east to west, coast to inland, and so on. Next slide. Um, this gives you an idea, and you can see this on the state climate website, uh, njclimate.org. These are, are bar graphs showing you the last 12 months of precipitation departures from normal on the top left and temperature departure departures from normal. This is based on an average of several dozen stations around the state. And with precip, you can see the first half of 2020 was on the dry side. The, the red bars show precipitation deficits for those months in the one inch range in three of those months. And then we got to the second half of the year and we turned on the spigot um, really beginning with Tropical Storm Fay on, I guess it was the 10th of July. We were really starting to get a little worried about being dry and then boy, uh, we were wet for the most part through the remainder uh, of 2020. 
On the bottom, you'll see the temperatures. Um, and you can see that 10 of the 12 months in 2020 had above normal temperatures. And, and of those 10, six ranked as among the 10th warmest of that particular month, going back 126 years in the record book. We had none make it to the top 10 dry or wet in, in 2020, but we had six make it into the top 10 for warmth. Um, really quite remarkable. But two months, May, uh, excuse me, April and May were below average. That was the first time in three years we had had two consecutive months below normal. Um, that's how warm New Jersey has been. And we'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Next slide, please. Okay, um, just a general general cartoon of the Earth's climate system. And I show this briefly. I could give a whole lecture. I could teach a whole semester just on this one slide. Uh, it shows all the players, um, starting with the sun uh, and all the spheres out there, the atmosphere, uh, the lithosphere, the, the volcanic activity that can affect climate, um, the biosphere, uh, be it desert, be it rainforest, and all things in between, and the hydrosphere, in particular our oceans. Um, and the, all of these interact along with the cryosphere, which happens to be my favorite because I do study global snow um, when I'm not state climatologist and teaching. Um, and that snow and ice and ice sheets uh, and permanently frozen land, permafrost. And then front and center, you notice in there, is uh, our, our us. You can see the factories belching out uh, smoke. You can see the agricultural lands. Um, so we are a big part of this system, as we all know, and we saw in the video, and, and we'll talk about a little more here. Um, so this is all encapsulated, and the point to make here, it's a system. It has no beginning. It has no end. Everything interacts with each other. You can't just separate one of these spheres out and talk about it without quickly bringing in other impacts from uh, the other spheres. So without going any further with that, next slide um, looks at, um, you know, we said this, this one I left in because, you know, people are always looking the here and now. This is last winter, but there's shades of this in this winter. Uh, if you recall, last winter was very mild. It was the third least snowy in 126 years in New Jersey. And it was because the polar jet stream um, was very circular. It didn't get wavy and it kept the cold air bottled up to the north and it didn't get down into our neck of the woods all that often. So we stayed mild and relatively quite snow free. Now, when the jet stream starts buckling, you can introduce very cold air to the south where it normally isn't found and warm air can pour up to the north. This more meridional pattern, it's called, can really give you strong climate extremes. And this is what the media, uh, you've been hearing in the media, uh, might be coming about in the next couple of weeks with what's called a stratospheric warming episode up in the pole, North Polar region. So the question is, where are those dips introducing cold air going to come? And where are the, the ridges, as we call them, with warm air coming up? And I just looked at the eight to 14 day outlook from the National Weather Service. And they have the Western US getting cold and the Eastern US getting warm. So if this vortex exchange is going to occur, it looks like first it's gonna deliver the cold air into the West. Now, as we get later in the winter, it could shift over to the East or the jet could retreat back to the North again and we get shut out. So snow lovers, not a lot of hope in the short term, but there's still a lot of winter to come. Next, please. And that, that's kind of the uh, epitome of weather and climate joining together to try to give us a feel for things. But getting back to the climate side, these are fresh out. I just grabbed them yesterday and they go up through 2020. These are New Jersey temperatures from 1895 to 2020 with a simple linear regression. And you can see New Jersey is getting warmer at almost three degrees Fahrenheit per century at that rate. And in the more recent couple of decades, it's even at a faster pace than that. And you can see that 
essentially all, almost all the warm years have been in the last couple of decades. Um, we just finished the second warmest year of the last 126. We did, we fell in behind 2012, uh, but we were the second warmest. Uh, what kept us from number one, frankly, was that April and May being below average, as you saw earlier, but a very warm year indeed. And it look at where the cooler years in the last 20 years have been. They're equivalent to the warmer years in most decades of the 20th century. Um, this is not an artifact of station moves. This is not an artifact of equipment changes. This is not an artifact of urban warming. Jersey was pretty urbanized in the last half of the 20th century, let's face it. This is a, a broad scale warming of New Jersey and we're seeing it in all seasons. Next, please. You're gonna see here in this figure, precipitation. Um, for the last 126 years. Uh, and you can see a slight increase in precipitation over time, about three inches per century, but that's based on a 45 plus inch annual change. So that's about a 6%, six to 7% increase in precipitation over the last century. But one thing you'll note in particular is that the, the, the annual up and down bar, um, bars there are quite variable. Uh, in the last couple of decades. In the first two thirds of the 20th century, you know, you had your wettest years and your driest years. Then you had the big drought of the 1960s, you can see there in the middle of the figure. And since then, there's been quite a bit of interannual variability uh, in the record, including this past decade where 2012, excuse me, 2011 was the wettest year on record in New Jersey until 2018 came along and just beat it out. So here we still get dry years, but we also get very wet years. So the variability has increased along with the actual magnitude of precipitation when you average the decades together. Next, please. Sea level, we are a coastal state um, with almost 130 miles of coast, but then we also have the Meadowlands and we have the Back Bays and we have Delaware Bay and up the lower reaches uh, of the Delaware River. And, and sea level is rising. These two graphs are from Sandy Hook and Atlantic City at the bottom. And they go back about a century, a little less at Sandy Hook. And you can see an upwards march of sea level of about 15 to 18 inches over the last century. And two thirds of that is due to the oceans getting warmer and thermally expanding and more water being poured in off ice sheets and melting alpine glaciers. Uh, about a third of it is because New Jersey's coastline is sinking um, post-glacial 20,000 years ago um, uh, geologic um, processes underway, still underway, and also extracting some groundwater from coastal areas through wells. So about two thirds is due to climate variability and change, about one third due to extraction of water uh, and a geologic um, post-glacial uh, sub subsidence of the land in the south part of the state. Next, <sighs> extremes. This is a big, this is a tricky one. Are, are we seeing more extremes in our weather and climate in New Jersey? Um, we certainly have seen it in the climate with the extreme wet years we've seen and the extreme warm years, but how about it, weather events? These are, are four photos I took the southern part of Manville in Somerset County um, on four different occasions of flooding on the southern part of town. Um, and there's a fifth flood in there and I didn't get a photo of in May of 2014. These five floods are the five of the seven largest floods on the Millstone River in the last century. Um, some of it may have something to do with a little bit of development upstream uh, but upstream is mostly suburban development. It's not urban development with huge percentages of impervious surfaces. Uh, but it's more a fact of having larger rainstorms over basin size rainstorms that have resulted in a flooding from a Floyd, from an Irene, 
and from a series of nor'easters. Um, so, but the fact they're extremes mean they're unusual. So it, it, you have to be patient as a climatologist. Meteorologists can get instant gratification or condemnation uh, based on their forecast. Um, but a climatologist, you have to be patient. You know, this is over 20 years, five major floods. Uh, it's suggestive of what we expect from a warming climate, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. But it, it's not certainly not proof positive at this point, but something to keep an eye on, a watchful eye on. Next. So what about New Jersey's future climate? What What is in store for us? You saw a lot about past, present, and future climate in in, in the show, and it was excellently done, and I'll comment on that a little bit later. Um, but what about Jersey's future climate? Uh, all evidence, all models suggest, and these are uh, numerical climate models that were talked about in the show. They showed you um, um, par a scene from the geophysical fluid dynamics lab, right down Route 1 at the Forestal campus um, uh, down near Princeton. Uh, where one of the very first climate models was developed in the 1960s. Uh, and they continue to do a wonderful job with their modeling program. But there's others around the world as well. And they all suggest temperatures along the mid-Atlantic are going to keep rising in, in the, uh, the years, decades, and century plus ahead. How much? <sighs> Ballpark? five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit still to come, perhaps by the end of the century. And you may say, wow, that's a pretty wide range. And, and it's more, not so much because the models disagree that much. It's more, we don't know the impact humans are going to have. Remember that in the, in the video, it said, that's the big uncertainty is us. Um, just what these models run with different emission scenarios. Um, do we clean up our act and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Do we run it with business as usual where we keep pouring them into the atmosphere? That's why you see such a large range in these predictions for the second half of the 21st century. So five to 10 degrees of warming, steadier increasing precipitation. Um, there's some seasonality to that though. And it looks like our winter's will get wetter, but our summers perhaps not. So hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, that could be a problem with our agriculture in the state because we're not going to start planting corn in January. Um, we're still going to be growing it during the summer. And if we are short on rainfall and, and increase evaporation with increasing heat, we could have some problems. Um, and then there's just more energy in the system. There's more energy, more heat in the atmosphere. There's more heat, a lot more heat in the ocean. About 90% of the greenhouse warming heat is being held by the oceans. Um, and, and there's more moisture in the atmosphere because a warmer atmosphere can have, has the potential of holding more moisture in it. So we're just primed for more extremes, um, more strong storms more flooding, certainly more heat, and yeah, even more drought. And you may say, well, I, I, I'm trying to get my way you know, by talking about more wetness and more dryness. What gives there? Well, think about it. There may be more moisture in the atmosphere, a hotter atmosphere, but if there's no trigger to wring that moisture out of the atmosphere, you're gonna have that hot sun pounding down and that's gonna dry things out. And ultimately, that's going to dry out the atmosphere, clean up the clouds, and we're going to have the sun beating down. And you can go from a drought until finally you get a trigger to come along, and that will re-moisten the atmosphere, and then you can have flooding rains. So look for that extremes and variability more in the future. And, and then sea level is going to keep rising. Um, it, it's going to keep rising perhaps another foot by the middle of this century three feet by the end of the century. Um, I think I threw in the next slide here, or a slide, if you go on. Oh, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute with the sea level. But first, I wanted to talk about this. All right, let's go to this one now. This gives you an idea of seaside heights looking down from above. The areas in light blue will be permanently underwater with a one foot, three foot, six foot sea level rise. Now, six foot, six feet, is lower probability, 
but 5% is far from zero probability. Um, more likely three feet. And that's going to really jeopardize the existence of our barrier island system in, in New Jersey. I think the next slide, I put in this just, uh, yeah, this lot of numbers. I usually don't like this, but this is based on a report I was involved with, led by Bob Kopp at Rutgers, Rutgers um, professors, and others from other state univer uh, other universities within New Jersey. Um, got together at the behest of the Department of Environmental Prediction, um, Protection um, <laughs> just a, a year, year, yeah, a year ago, I guess it was 2019 in December we put this out. Um, and I show you this because I want to drum home the idea that we're talking about probabilities here. I know everybody likes everything to be what we call deterministic. This exactly is going to happen and it's going to happen now. That's just not the way science works. There's probabilities in terms of the timing and the magnitude of things. And that's why I'm showing this slide, um, just to, to make sure I make that point. Now, if we could go back two slides, um, I'll talk about probabilities again. Um, this time, talking thermally. This, this is, you might have someone say, well, it's still freezing cold today, or last week was brutally cold, or it snowed on May 9th this past year, which it did. And May 9th was one of the coldest May days on record in New Jersey. The wind chill factor at high point was three degrees on the 9th of May. But you have to look at these probability distributions here. On the left is a graph where say back in the, the middle to late part of the 20th century, that was the distribution of temperatures across the Northern hemisphere in the summer. It really doesn't matter here. And you can see most of them fall in the middle part, but there's ends, uh, limbs to each of them with extremes and then cold, extreme cold, cold, then on the right, warmer than average and extreme warm. Well, what we're doing is shifting that that curve over in the, the early part of this century. And the distribution is in the graph on the right. Now it's not as peaked, it's a little more spread out the curve, but notice that with that shift, those hot days that come in are much more likely to happen. The extreme hot days, rather than being a total outlier, are all too frequent, but there's still that probability of having cold conditions. It's not as common, but they can still happen. And you have to remember this. It's not like everything, every day, every month, every year is going to get be warm. There's still going to be that natural distribution from weather patterns that impact our particular area or the globe for that matter. So let's jump ahead four slides now. To, yeah, I, I just kind of want to finish up with a little bit of the social science societal side on this, uh, putting on my broader geographer's hat, although this is out, we're starting to branch out of my direct domain, but I want to point out the impacts of change. And, and these are happening now in New Jersey. And I go and talk to health officers of communities and they tell me how the warming is changing um, the, the weather-related mortality and heat waves, infectious diseases, and, and air pollution may be getting hotter, more stagnant days, which result in, in all kinds of respiratory and even pulmonary issues. You look in the forests, um, there is the southern pine beetle affecting the pinelands. Um, that's a beetle that was kept in check by extremely cold winter temperatures in the Pinelands, um, getting below zero Fahrenheit a couple of times a winter. Well, I worked with someone from Dartmouth who was looking at this, and I, I was shocked myself to find out that our coldest of cold winter days in New Jersey are warming at a faster rate than the cold average temperatures in winter. Uh, so that's allowing the pine beetle to winter over more often and start decimating our forests. So these are just a couple of examples, and I could go on and on. Um, and, and hopefully you've read about these. You've maybe 
uh, attended seminars by others. Maybe others could come in and talk about this in future programs. Um, but we're seeing it, seeing these things happening uh, already uh, from our coast to our forests, to our agricultural lands, to our very health and safety, uh, and even our transportation systems as well. So it's, it, is it a dire picture? Well, we can talk about that a little bit, but I, again, that comes down to what we, us, uh, what we're going to do about this. So anyway, just moving on to the next slide here. Um, these, this is kind of my preachy set of um, points I want to make here as we start to finish up. Here are some things I think require attention. Um, we need to learn more about this. Thanks for coming tonight and listening to me babble on. Um, thanks for watching. And if you haven't watched the Decoding the Weather Machine yet, I absolutely recommend it. Um, the more we understand what's going on and we all agree something is going on and something critical is coming on, then we can say, well, maybe we need to do something about this. And that brings us to the next point. We need to, to, to mitigate. And we saw these in, in, the, uh, in, in the video. It said suffering mitigation, and the next you can guess is adaptation. Um, mitigate. We can still do something about this, but let's face it, we're also going to have to adapt, and we're already learning to adapt. Um, the buzzword this day and age is resilient. We're going to have to become more resilient because we're, we're not going to mitigate ourselves out of this situation. It's just come too far. But we can, as the video said, reduce the need to adapt by increasing our mitigative efforts. And then finally, you have to get out there and, and be active. Um, the last one here, activism, leadership, um, join your community, come to talks like this and then go out and do something personally, something in your community, write your, your legislators at the state and, and national levels, have your say, and then by all means, look at the platforms of the candidates. And if this is an important issue to you, um, vote accordingly. Um, so a, a lot that can be done still to give you some glimmers of, of hope that we're gonna be able to get control of this. I, I like to say, and they hinted at this in the video, we were smart enough to get ourselves into this mess, developing the combustion engine, the industrial society coming on. We were smart enough to get ourselves into this. I'd like to think that we're smart enough to figure our way out of this. I sure don't have all the answers. That's outside my expertise. They, they did discuss this at some length, although briefly, in, in the program. Um, but I don't want to leave people... Uh, feeling hopeless about this. There are things we can still do. Um, we've pretty much set the table for the next 30 years. No matter what we do right now, all the models suggest we're going to get what we get. But the actions we take now are going to have an impact on the last half of this century. Uh, and there's a lot of people already alive on this planet who are going to be living through the last half of this century. Um, and it behooves us as the adults of this age, I, I would say, if I, I, I want to get out there and state my claim, we need to do something about this to make a better future for children and, and, and our grandchildren um, for some of us. Um, next slide. I just want to finish up with just a couple little things um, you can do to follow the weather and climate of the Garden State. Uh, we have the Rutgers, New Jersey Weather Network. Uh, it's about 65 stations from High Point Monument to West Cape May and all points in between. Um, you might just notice in the lower right there, it says East Brunswick. Yes, we have a station at the uh, municipal, at the uh, county waste facility in, in East Brunswick, another one on campus in New Brunswick. Um, and you can go in and every five minutes, get a look at the weather um, that's going on around the state, temperature, precipitation, wind, solar radiation, and so on uh, and so forth. Um, the next slide shows you what you can do, actually, if you want to get out there and volunteer. And there may be some of you listening in who are already part of the COCORAS program in New Jersey. It's a national program. 
Um, there are about 300 active observers in New Jersey who get uh, a rain gauge, a standard rain gauge for the program shown on the left, then a ruler, and you maybe you'll make yourself a snowboard to measure your snow on, and you go out seven in the morning. When it's snowing, you go out and take a measurement when it hits its deepest depth. You don't necessarily wait till seven the next morning. And then you go online uh, on, your, on your phone or on the computer and you enter your data. It becomes part of the national database. And the next one shows you what we do in Jersey. We make maps. Uh, every, every, day, every morning we're making maps. The map on the left shows you spotty rain, reason why we need so many observers. These are all volunteers. Our 65 automated stations, which measure rain every five minutes, aren't on that map. And you can see uh, some areas were wet, some areas are dry, so on and so forth. And on the right is a major storm at the end of this past September, where the pink areas there show roughly two or more inches of rain all the way up the western side of, of the state. Yet look at how little in the green fell down in Cape May under a couple tenths of an inch, for instance. So that's the Coco Ross program. And uh, you can be a citizen science volunteer. Go to cocoraz.org. It will show you how to sign on, how to get, purchase a rain gauge. It's about $35. It's a cheap hobby, the way I like to say. And, and you can be part of our Coco Ross program. So with that, let me sum up the next slide. We do have our weather and climate in New Jersey, and it can go in all sorts of directions. That's what I love about it. I would be bored as heck if I lived in San Diego. Um, but I love the variability, of our four seasons, and you, so on and so forth. But we tend to get wild weather, but most often we don't get the worst of the worst. We don't get the worst tornadoes. We tend not to get the worst hurricanes, so on and so forth. So that's not bad. Um, our climate is changing. I hope I've convinced you of that quite clearly. And, and the models suggest that it's going to keep changing. Um, it's simple physics of the greenhouse effect. Our observations show it. Our the physics show it. And our models show it. Um, and, and with that, we're going to have more extremes. Um, um, things may change faster. Uh, impacts are going to expand. Um, and become more noteworthy. Um, but again, there's still that hope of combination of mitigative and adaptative, adaptive, excuse me, actions to address or at least attenuate these condition, conditions. And of course, finish up with the observations. I am more an empiricist than a modeler. Uh, it behooves us to keep a keen eye on New Jersey's weather and climate, enjoying it, enjoying it safely, um, but also being aware that it is something to be reckoned with here on the weather side or in the future as we look to our uh, changing climate. And with that, the next slide shows you that it still does snow in New Jersey. And it's my estimation that this is probably the best use of a golf course. <laughs> this is from just uh, last month um, with my cross country skis out on the, the the, the fifth fairway of the local golf course. Uh, so anyway, um, thanks for joining tonight. I'd be happy to answer questions. I know some of you may have to have other things to attend to, but I will be happy to answer questions. Okay, so um, we have some that people submitted in advance and we have some people in the chat now. So I'm gonna try to yeah. pair them together as much as possible. Terrific. So um, one's gonna be a macro kind of question followed by something that's a little bit closer in. So the first question is, what is New Jersey as a state doing right now to combat climate change? So what's all happening at the state house? And the other question, which is, the much more specific on where is it? I just had it and it's up higher up. Uh, hold on, because it's um, it's from Jaylish and it is, is there anything I can do individually about climate change? Terrific, uh, terrific questions. Uh, start on the big scene. Uh, at the state level, uh, climate is in the forefront at NJDEP and in the governor's office. The first lady is very interested in this. She was trained in Al Gore's camp there. Um, and, and there are educational 
uh, efforts underway to integrate climate into all, um, not only all grades, but all subjects. I've actually met with uh, Department of Education folks to give them this kind of primer, if you will, um, just to take away the fear factor from those who are involved with English uh, and, and, and social studies and talk about how we can bring it into the math curriculum. And of course, all aspects of science curriculum. So it, it's got a great push at, at the state level um, right now. Um, and, and I hope that continues uh, in, into the future. Um, bringing it down to the local level, there's local activities going on, green teams within communities. And then down to the personal level, I, I already mentioned, you, you write a letter to your, your congressman and, and that, that can make an impact. Um, you join a local uh, organization uh, you support a non-governmental organization that's out preserving land or doing research uh, into our environment and the impacts of climate change on our environment. Um, get on a planning board if, if that's your, your specialization. Um, if you're a communicator, write a piece, an op-ed, and submit it to a, a local paper or online uh, resource. Uh, and then ultimately, um, you know, think about using less energy and using greener energy because it's, it's really both involved here. Um, electric vehicles, um, solar panels on your roof. Uh, let's not forget water. That's really, really important. Uh, use your water more prudently. Uh, don't drown your lawns. Um, be aware of every drop of water you use, not just in the dry years, but any year. Um, all of these things, and you know, it's the thermostat is important, let's face it. And, and remember, there's 9 million of us. So what your actions do, if we multiply it by millions, that makes a big difference. So keep that in mind as you do something personally and say, ah, what difference can it make? Well, it can make a big difference, let alone perhaps setting an example for your kids or the kids out there can set examples and get their parents moving on these things. Okay, so I have another good pairing of someone who submitted in advance and someone in the chat right now. Um, someone had asked, at what point would climate change make parts of New Jersey Shore uninhabitable? You did have that slide. Or even parts of the eastern seaboard where there is already flooding at high tide. And then the live question was specifically, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I believe it was about Louisiana, yes. So Jayush had all had asked that will Louisiana flood at the rising sea level? So is it just happening on the East Coast? Is it happening all around us? You know, is it going to be pinpointing or targeted depending on you know the level of impact, how everything you know yeah. moves around? No, it, it, and as the video even pointed out, it, it's it's everywhere globally. Now we're learning that some areas are more vulnerable than others. Um, without getting into any details of ocean circulation and the melting of sea ice, uh, excuse me, not sea ice, melting of glacial ice, ice sheets and all, and rebounding of land, it gets complicated. But the fact is, if you're uh, a huge portion of the global population lives at or near sea level, and this goes far beyond New Jersey, far beyond Norfolk and Miami Beach. In fact, there's far more vulnerable people in Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, um, other parts of the world where they're already uh, marginalized by the, the life, the impoverished lives they live, and they're particularly vulnerable. They mentioned the Marshall Islands and other atolls out there in the Pacific and, and other low island nations. Their very existence, uh, it depends on trying to get this under control. So going close to the Jersey Shore, you saw that one image of Seaside Heights. We get a six-foot rise in sea level. Um, we've lost our barrier defenses, basically. Uh, are we going to build seawalls to encapsulate Long Beach Island? Um, probably not. Uh, we're going to retreat inland. That's a word people don't want to hear along the coast, and I'm not advocating for it now. I'm advocating for a prudent um, uh, actions as we seek to, to live along our coast as long as we can and as safely as we can. Um, but, you know, we're going to be facing later in this century um, 
decisions that we're only just talking about now. Um, we're going to need to take action further in the future. We're already seeing this sunny day or fair weather flooding. Um, they mentioned the King Moon in there. Um, we're already seeing those those that flooding because remember, just a foot rise in sea level doesn't just come a foot up the beach. It spreads out. You have to use your geometry there and see how what an impact it can have. Um, so um, we're you know for the time being, it's the major storms that are going to do the most damage. But in the future, the minor storms are going to start doing major damage, uh, and then. If the sea level gets out of control, um, we're going to have a hard time just sustaining operations along our, our coast of New Jersey and elsewhere around the world. Okay. So our, I'll give you the easier one, and then I'll give you the more complex one. How about that? So <laughs> question. Well, it's you know, this is an important one. So we talked about the whole personal responsibility, water, Free energy. Um, uh, Amy asks, where is there reliable information on clean energy businesses from which we can purchase electricity? It's hard to know who to trust in this area. You know, we get these things in the mail. Like what, where is there a good like clearinghouse that is at the state level of finding that information? Or are we still really in the wild west about all of this right mm -hmm. now? Uh, you know, when I don't know something, I'll admit I don't know it. I, I really don't know where to go look. I, I would go look at the Board of Public Utilities in New Jersey and contact them. Um, that would be a good place to start. Uh, and then go online and look carefully around there. Um, I don't know if you go to your, your electric, gas and electric purveyors right now, uh, the programs they have. I, I can't speak to them. Um, but they're hopefully going to be conscientious about doing the best in the, in the long term for them, their business, as well as their, their customers. Uh, but perhaps the BPU, um, on the federal level, um, I'm really not well-versed enough to, to say much about it. But uh, the point you made, though, with your question is, yes, be, be, be careful out there. Um, before you make a decision that you uh, are an investment that you might regret. But I tell you, I'd say that more carefully 10 years ago than I'd say it now, because things are really starting to fall into place better than they were 10, 15 plus years ago. Okay, let's go to the one that's going to definitely be talking about the world of deniers and misinformation is something, you know, obviously with topics of any sort of information now is important. So this one's a little bit unique and then I'll roll back to another one. So Sandy asks, how can there be climate change deniers in the science community? So people and specialists, you know, that might you might know or interact with, is there oh, yeah. any valid research out there that really says we're not responsible for climate change and thus do not have to mitigate it? Yeah, that's uh, kind of made the news this week with, uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Delaware being told to leave the White House um, by someone directing the White House Science Program, who I've is an atmospheric scientist who is a professor at, at the University of Oklahoma, who I, I happen to know, uh, Kevin Druckmeyer. Um, yeah, um, there is still a small group of skeptics. Uh, mind you, scientists by their na our nature are skeptical. But we're talking about people that are, you know, getting past the skeptical side to just simply denying the science of it for whatever the reason might be in. Let them try to explain it or you try to explain it. Um, the vast majority of climate scientists see a huge human footprint on the climate system and what we're doing. Sure. Solar variability has had some effect, volcanic activity, some effect. 